I think everybody here understands that the Father sent His Son to die for our sins, right? We understand that all of us were sinners, but because of what Jesus has done, we can have peace with God. Amen? And we understand that He sent His Spirit to dwell within our hearts to be the comforter and to lead us in truth. Amen? Is there anything difficult about that? If somebody brings you a message and it starts getting difficult, get back to the Bible. Are you with me? My heart's burdened this morning. I know people who love God, are passionate about God, and they're led astray by movements that come through our communities. And brothers and sisters, I don't want that to happen to anybody here this morning. And the way you can make sure it happens is stay in the Word of God. God has told us what we need to know to know Him, to connect with Him, and to live today. And He's not going to add to this. And He's not going to take this away. And He's not going to change this. These kind of things are not new in 2018. When Paul writes the letter of, to the church at Galatia, he starts out in verse 1. He says, how can you all be removed so quickly from the faith that you once had? And Judaizers had come in and, and tried to uh, and had deceived them and, and brought them into some bondage and, and saying, yeah, Christianity is okay, but, but you've got to follow certain laws of Judaism to, to be a Christian and so on. And then Paul says this, and this is why I bring this out to you before we get into the message this morning. He says this, though we, referring to himself and the apostles, or anyone else, or even an angel from heaven, preach anything else but the gospel of Jesus Christ, let him be accursed. Hang on to the gospel of Jesus Christ, because that's the only way. And there's a whole lot that's going to come, in, that's going to come like it did then, and Paul just brought him back to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to hang on. To what Jesus Christ has done for us, I am not going to. Uh, I'm not going to talk much this morning about walking in the Spirit. That's what I'm going to preach on tonight. So, if you're saying oh, you talked about the Holy Spirit this morning, but tell me what does it mean to flesh that out? Come back tonight at six thirty. Actually, come at six. We need to pray first. But uh, tonight, the title of the message will be walking in the Spirit. This morning. We're going to do, start where we need to with try the spirits. There's a story in 1 Kings 13 that I'm going to tell you. There we go. Story in 1 Kings chapter 13, and it goes like this. You can turn to 1 John chapter 4. Our text is going to be 1 John chapter 4. Let me tell you a story out of 1 Kings Chapter 13, there says there was a man of God that went up from Judah up to Bethel. He was sent there to prophesy against King Jeroboam and against the altar there. And his prophecy was to was this. He says, you're to go up and you're to say, there will be one born to the, uh, in the, to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he's going to offer high priest on this altar, and men's bones are going to be burnt on this altar, and then a proof that this is really going to happen is that the altar is going to be rent apart and the ashes are going to spill out. So not a, you know, come encourage the brotherhood kind of a message, right? He goes up from Judah up to Bethel, goes into the temple area to make this prophecy. And uh, in one way, you'd say, unfortunately, the wicked King Jeroboam is there. Uh, but it's fitting because he's going to prophesy against him. So King Jeroboam's there, who is a, a very ungodly king. All these other people. So this man of God out of Judah went up to Bethel and he goes in there and he, and he makes this prophecy. He says, there will be one born to the house of David, Josiah by name, and he's going to offer a high priest right here on this altar. Men's bones are going to be burnt on this altar. 
And then he says, the proof that it's going to happen is this altar's going to be split apart and the ashes are going to fall out. Now, when he says this, like I mentioned, King Jeroboam is a wicked king. And if a wicked king doesn't like you, what's he do? So he just says, lay hold on him. Now, that puts you in a bad position. When the king says, lay hold on you, immediately you've got soldiers who surround you. And, you know, if you're fortunate, you're just going to end up in prison. More likely, you're going to lose your head or something. He says, lay hold on him. And immediately when he did that, the altar rent apart, broke in two. The ashes spilled out. That's a sign that this prophecy was true. And his arm withered up that he couldn't even draw it back to himself. So he's like, lay hold on him. And now he can't even bring his arm back in. And then he says this to this man of God. He says, heal me. That's what I thought. I would have said, sorry, buddy, <laughs> you're on your own now. But I guess uh, the man of God was a little more, uh, had crucified more of the flesh than I did because he said, so he healed him and he brings the hand back to himself. And then he says this, he says, I want you, this man of God, to come home and have dinner with me. Whoa. Now he goes from lay hold on him to heal me, now come home and have dinner with me. And I know what we're going to have downstairs is going to be really good today, no doubt. But if you go to the king's house, woo, like that's some good eating. But the man of God does this. He says, I'm sorry, but the mess, the, when God spoke to me, he said, I'm to go up to Bethel. I'm to make this prophecy. I'm to eat or drink nothing, and I'm to go home another way. Even if you would give me a present up to half your household, I won't go home and eat with you. Ooh, that's commitment. Jeroboam is a fast learner, at least in this, the, today he was. He doesn't argue. Okay, no problem. The man of God leaves the temple courtyard and heads home another way. And by the way, if you uh, think I'm adding to this story and making up, you read 1 Kings 13. It's right there. He heads home another way. Meanwhile, in that crowd that day were some young men, some sons of an elderly prophet there in Bethel. And you know when everybody left that temple and went home, you know what they're talking about that day, right? Well, these young men come home and they tell their father, this elderly prophet, they say, you wouldn't believe what we saw today at the temple. What would you see? And they say, this man of God came up, and he prophesied, and, and then the king says, lay hold on him, and his hand withered, and he healed him. And, Woo. and they'll prophesy, say, well, which way did he go? And they say, well, he you know, went out this way. He says, hey, get my donkey ready. They get his donkey ready. And the old prophet sets out to catch this man of God from Judah. He overtakes him. You know, there's maybe his donkey had more horsepower than the other donkey. But he overtakes him, and he says, Stop. He says, I want you to come home and have dinner with me. And now you and I know there's two reasons why you're not going to do that. Number one, God told you not to. Number two, why would you eat, you know, mutton stew with the old prophet when you passed up steaks with the king? You know, he's going to tell him no. And that's what he does. He says, I'm sorry, but the Lord said I'm to go up. I'm to prophesy. I'm not to eat or drink anything. I'm to go home another way. End of discussion. Except the old prophet said this. I'm a man of God like you. And an angel came to me and told me to tell you to come home and eat dinner with me. Don't you hate when God does that? When he says one thing and then he changes his mind on you? What do you do? What do you do? Let me give you a few thoughts before we finish this story. There is so much done today in the name of the Spirit. I think we would agree with that. Some of it really is of the Spirit of God. Much of it is not at all done in the name of the Spirit of God. How do we tell the difference? Is it even right for us to challenge someone when they say, Oh, the Spirit of God told me this. Is it right for us to say, Really? You know, that really doesn't sound very spiritual to challenge somebody when they say the Spirit of God spoke to me. Let's finish the story. The older prophet says, I'm a man of God like you. An angel from God came to you and told me to tell you to come home and have dinner with me. So what does the man of God out of Judah do? He turns his donkey around and he follows him home. And listen to me. He comes home with him. He sits down and he eats. He takes his first bite of food and the older prophet looks at him and says because you've disobeyed the word of the lord and came home and eaten with me you're not going to make it home 
you're going to die on your way home. I don't know if he finished eating, but sometime soon after, he got on his donkey and he headed home. And 1 Kings 13 tells us a lion meets him on the way and kills him. And everybody that passed by that way would pause at that place and say, there lies the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. This man of God out of Judah, we're never given his name, but he's remembered as there lies the man of God who was disobedient to the word of the Lord. Now, I don't know what that does to you, but when the old prophet says, I'm a man of God like you, and an angel came from God and told me to tell you to come back, and then he takes a bite and he says, because you disobeyed, that ticks me off. I say, how can you do that, old prophet? You knowingly deceived him. Brothers and sisters, this is happening today. This isn't something that just happened back then. We must know the Spirit of God. We must try the spirits to make sure, is this of God, is it not? Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. It's going to be our text, and we're going to look at what John has to say about this. Beginning with verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. He doesn't waste long just to tell us what we're supposed to do. We could just close in prayer right here because we've got, we got the answer. Don't believe every spirit. Try the spirits. Try them. Are they of God? Let's read through here. We're going to see three tests that John gives us it, to help us in trying the spirits. Verse 2, Hereby know you the Spirit of God. Every spirit that, professes, or that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it in the world. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world, therefore speak ye of the world, and the world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of air. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him and he in us, because he hath given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him, because he first loved us. If a man say, I love God, and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God... Love his brother also. Let's just pray. Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus, and I pray you'd help us to understand the scripture. Father, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would be a people who follows you, who seeks after you, who knows your word, who studies your word, so that we're not deceived. So speak to our hearts, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. How do I know? If a spirit is the spirit of God. I'm going to give you three tests that come through this passage. Let me first tell you a story. While we were living in uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand, there was a lot of missionaries in the, in the uh, city of, of Chiang Mai because of where we're located in northern Thailand. A lot of closed access countries around us, so countries can, or ministries, missions can base there and go out and reach in these countries. Well, an American missionary stopped by Igo one day to talk to our pastor, and she had a little problem. She's having back problem. 
And when our pastor said, so where's this back problem coming from? She said, well, she's one of the ones at her church that towards the end of the service, she's supposed to go up front. And then when the pastor goes like this, she's supposed to follow her backwards. And now she has back problem. Now, falling over backwards up here would hurt. If it was a church like Thailand where it's cement or if it's a nice church, ceramic tile on cement, uh, one fall gives me back problem. This is an American missionary. She's not an ignorant new believer. This is a mission-run church kind of deal. And it's not occurring to her that the way to take care of this back problem is to stop falling over on a hard tile floor. It's just part of what she needs to do. My God, your God, has plenty of power to knock people over if he wants to show off his power. And if somebody asks you to act for them so that people think they have power, that's called hypocrisy. And where's that happening? In the church. It never occurred to her that she should just say, I'm sorry, pastor, but I'm not going to be a part of your act at the end of the service. That church is preaching Jesus. Okay, that's far out. That's far out. Maybe not as far out as we'd like to think. How do I know a spirit is the spirit of God? Number one, his spirit will lead to Jesus. Three things, three tests here from 1 John 4 that help us discern, is this the spirit of God? God's spirit will lead to Jesus. And from verse 2, verse 3, Hereby know you the spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. If, if someone, if someone is, claims to have the spirit of God, what are they pointing you to? Are they pointing you to Jesus? That's the first place the spirit of God is going to do. He's going to point us to Jesus. Every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ in the come in the flesh is not of God. Who's getting glorified? Through this brother who says, I've got the Spirit of God. And when a pastor says, I need you to come up and put in this act for me, who's, who's trying to get glory there, huh? Anybody that's trying to create a following after themselves does not have the Spirit of God, period. I don't think everybody heard me. Anybody that's trying to create a following, we want people to come after me, or we want to make ourselves look good. Brothers and sisters, the Spirit of God is not in that. There is a Spirit in that, very obviously, but it's not the Spirit of God. You see, the Spirit of God is going to point us to Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, we're lost. We're dead in our sins. With Jesus Christ, we have peace with God. So the first thing the Spirit of God is going to do is going to point us to Jesus. Who's getting glory in this meeting? Who's getting glory in this church? Who's getting glory in this movement, in this organization? Is Jesus being lifted up? And if you're not sure, I'd get out of it. Scripture says this, as you read through the Gospel of John. It says that the Son glorifies the Father. You with me? Son glorifies the Father. It also says in John that the Father glorifies the Son. You with me? And then it says that the Spirit glorifies the Father and the Son. You still with me? Now, here I'm going to make some of you study. Who glorifies the Spirit? Who glorifies the Spirit? It doesn't say. Because... The Father doesn't glorify the Spirit. The Son doesn't glorify the Spirit. So let me tell you this. A Spirit that glorifies itself, that magnifies itself, is not the Spirit of God. Why was the Holy Spirit, why is the Holy Spirit sent to the world today? He's sent to be our comforter, to dwell within us, to lead us to truth. He's not here to lift up himself. He's here to lead us into truth, to point us to Jesus. That's the work of the Spirit. 
And people say, oh, so you're going to say the Father glorifies the Son, the Son glorifies the Father, the Spirit glorifies the Father and the Son, and none of them are glorifying the Spirit. Oh, you're kind of putting the Spirit down here. No! Who sent the Son to die for our sins? The Father. Who died for our sins? The Son. The Father didn't die for our sins, so does that make him less? No! His work was to send the Son. The Son's work was to die for us. The Spirit's work is to dwell within our hearts and to lead us to truth. It's three in one, one God. But we're missing that today. A spirit that glorifies itself is not the spirit of God. Now, those of you who are struggling with me, that's good, because you'll study then. And if you find scripture that tells me where the spirit's going to be glorified and point to itself, or where the son's going to glorify, please let me know, because I'm not finding it. And when I find the nature of what the Father has done, what the Son has done, what the Spirit has done, that's where it's at right there. The Spirit is going to lead us to Jesus. It's not going to lift himself up. Let's go on to the next point. His Spirit is going to lead to love. And this passage is full of this. And it makes sense because God is love. Brothers and sisters, as God's Spirit dwells within you, oh, I hope you have a burden of passion for truth, but I hope you are a man or a woman of love. And as you deal with with struggling brothers or sisters, or as you deal with somebody who's getting swept away in this, do you work in love? If you don't work in love, you're not working in the Spirit of God. And what's interesting is that as I've interacted with different religions and different cults, a common thing I find there is when they see they're not going to swing me, they try to belittle me and try to humiliate me. May that never be said so about God's people. Our goal is not to show up a false religion. Our goal is not to lift ourselves up. Our goal is not to make them feel bad. Our goal is to show them the love of Jesus Christ. His spirit will point to love. And if it's not in love, it's not of God. That's why Paul said we speak the truth in love. And here again is where we can get on a ditch where it's just love, love, love. But if you really love, you're going to speak truth. Or we can say it's truth, 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 and we're just going to hammer truth, and we speak truth in anger. And what does that do? Paul says, combine them. Just like we talked about on uh, Thursday night, we cannot separate love and obedience. Really, you can't separate love and truth. Speak the truth in love. His spirit is going to lead us to love. And the third thing that his spirit is doing, his spirit is going to lead us to truth. He says this, you have God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. They are of the world. Therefore, speak ye of the world. The world heareth them. We are of God. He that knoweth God heareth us. He that is not of God heareth not us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. This one is so common today. Well, I don't need to do what this says anymore because God's Spirit told me this doesn't apply anymore. And we don't even challenge that. There's a lot of names given to the Holy Spirit. Comforter, Spirit of Truth. God's Spirit, the Holy Spirit, has never contradicted the Word of God. Maybe I haven't understood a passage or maybe I haven't understood something and God's spirit helps me understand. No, this is what is being said. But the Holy Spirit isn't giving new revelations that correct this or that replace this. The Holy Spirit points us to truth. We have got to dig into the word of God. We have not got to know what the word of God says because today this is being minimized there's even people get into these movements that, you know, why do we have to have our devotions every day? And, and, and it, by, by, first of all, it shouldn't be a religious thing that we have to, but it's like excusing the whole thing of being in the word of God and we minimize the necessity to read our Bibles and just listen to what the Spirit tells you. I find the best place to start hearing the Spirit of God is when I read my Bible. And then after I read my Bible, I say, As I go throughout the day, he leads me, he talks to me, but he has never told me anything contrary to the word of God, and he never will. His spirit will lead to Jesus, who's getting glorified. His spirit will lead to love. His spirit will lead to truth, always. And 
as you interact with people, as some movement comes along, or somebody says, oh, the Spirit of God spoke to me. If any one of these three are, contra- are missing, if two are there but not the third, it's not of God. It's got to be 100%. God's not in that. God's not in that. Will always lead to Jesus. Will always lead to love. Will always lead to truth. Now, let, let me give you a couple verses here. And I'll just put these up here on the screen for you. John 14, 16. I will pray the Father. He should give you another comforter that he may abide with you forever. See, when Jesus was talking to his disciples, he says, hey, I'm going to leave. I'm going to go away. And, of course, the disciples were, they were flesh and blood just like us. And so they argued about who gets to sit beside Jesus. And, of course, you know, Peter would butt in there and always be next to Jesus. Or you know how it went. Uh, and so, you know, uh, the one of the mothers comes to Jesus and say, hey, hey, can my two sons sit next to you in the kingdom to come? So they had those type of things. So when Jesus says, I'm going to leave, it's like, oh. And then he says, hey, but don't worry. I'm going to send the comforter. And good news, you don't have to fight over who gets the comforter. You all get him. I'm going to send the comforter. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwells in you with you and shall be in you let's look at another verse john 15 26 but when the comforter is come who i will send unto you from the father even the spirit of what even the spirit of truth which proceeded from the father he shall testify of who of me of jesus When a Holy Spirit movement is going on, you know it's of the Holy Spirit when it's the name of Jesus that's being lifted up and everybody's being pointed to Jesus and the conference that's being advertised or whatever it may be is all about Jesus. If it's not, it's not of God, period. And ye also shall bear witness because ye have been with me From the beginning, John 16, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it's expedient or it's necessary that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment, of sin because they believe not in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, of judgment because the Prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you can't bear them now. And I'm thankful for this about Jesus. He understood that disciples wouldn't get the whole load. So he says, I'm going to tell you what I can, and you're going to forget some things, but the Holy Spirit's going to reveal these things as you need them. You study the Word of God. You've listened this week. And don't stress yourself over remembering all these things, but as you study and you read, God's going to bring to remembrance what you need to hear as you continue to walk in Him. And that's what He's telling His disciples here. Howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He will not speak of Himself. I guess you don't have to study that after all. Well, if you're not convinced that the Holy Spirit isn't going to lift itself up or that the Spirit of God will not magnify itself, I would start right here. He's not going to speak of himself. Whatever he hears, that will he speak, and he will show you things to come. He will glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now, I would like to talk a little bit more about receiving the holy spirit and and the whole there's a whole lot on that we're going to leave that for tonight but i am going to give you i'm going to tell you a quick story and i am going to give you six six things that the spirit of this world does because of what we face today and to to me this is very necessary let me really quickly try to tell you a story uh again first-hand experiences i i know and love people who were passionate about god who have been led astray and this is how it happens as we uh, spend some time in, in Thailand, we're training young people in missions, uh, and I see several of my former IGO students there, and I love every one of them, and it's good to see them, good to see them here. We're blessed with great people at IGO, and uh, this, this particular year was not an exception. We invited all the students and the staff to our house on a Saturday evening, and one of the young men didn't come, and I asked the dean, I said, where is this young man? He says, I'm not sure. I said, well, when you get back to the dorm, check on him, make sure he's okay. Sorry, I got to go fast here, because we don't want the stake to be burnt downstairs. He got back to the dorm and he called me and he said he's not here and I don't know where he is. So I began to try to uh, find him and after a while I was able to connect with him on his cell phone and I said, where are you? Now this is a student who's been in our program both semesters. We're coming 
to the end of our fifth term. So he's been there for seven months now. And God has been doing a work in his heart. Healing has come through some difficulties. And it's exciting to see what's going on. I said, where are you? And he didn't want to tell me. Finally, he said this. Oh, I'm hiding out with Jesus. Oh, that's good. Can I come hide with you? I said, well, where are you? And after a while, it took a while, he finally told me where he was. And I got permission to come see him. So now we're way past midnight on the Saturday night. We're getting towards 1 o'clock. I hop in my van. I drive to where he is. He is at a guest house, not far from I go. I go up to the room where he's at, and in his room, he's sitting on a bed, and he's got two suitcases in his carry-on. All his stuff is there. He's packed to leave. I said, what are you doing? He said, well, a messenger told me I should get out of here. A messenger? Yeah, he said, you know, you know, Rick and Val, I go will only take you so far, but they're, they're going to control you. If you, wanna, if you really want to go somewhere, you just follow Jesus. After, uh, you know, so I asked him, I said, have we controlled you? You know, what kept him from leaving is his passport was in the safe in our office. Uh, and we don't do that out of controlling people, but we just keep them there. They're safe so people don't steal them because the bu- building is pretty open to the public there. Uh, so he's kind of held up without his passport. I said, if it's the best thing for you to do, and if you really want to go, I'll go get your passport and let you go. We're not, we're not trying to tie you down. But is that really what you want? So I began to probe into who's this messenger. And the messenger was somebody who had led vision teams to Asia, somebody who was passionate about God. And somewhere along the line, some form of wave of deceit came in, and he got the idea that he doesn't need church. And as I understand today, so as, as he's talking to this friend, he said, um, just follow Jesus. Get out from all other man-made authority and just follow Jesus. Well, that, that sounds like it's scriptural talk, right? Don't stand under man-made authority. Just go with Jesus. Oh, the Spirit of God leads us to Jesus. Oh, this sounds good. Be careful, and I'm going to give you six things that, we get, that will help us discern this. I understand that this messenger isn't even a part of any church today because he just doesn't need Jesus. And now when Sunday comes, he takes his kids fishing. He doesn't really have to go to church. And what was known as a man who was passionate and zealous for God, not that way anymore. How did it happen? Because somewhere he got deceived. And it almost happened to this young man. As I sat there and listened to this young man just ask him questions, he began to see that, no, he doesn't want to go home. I prayed with him there. And we carried his suitcase back down to my van. And again, this was on his own will. He wants to stay and finish this out. We went back to Igo. The dorm is on the fourth floor, so we're going through three floors. When we got to the third floor where the classroom was, and I can still see this clear as day, he set his suitcases down, and he turned to me, and he said this, it is so good to be back. Now, you'd almost laugh, because what was it? Six hours ago, he left. But in his heart, he was leaving. And there wasn't a peace in it. And when he fortunately listened to counsel, he came back and he finished out, wow, praise God, so close to being deceived. Six things the spirit of this world is going to lead us to. And we've got to make sure we understand these. Number one, isolation, anti-relationship. The spirit of this world will lead us into isolation, anti-relationship. God is a relational God. So if there's a spirit leading you to isolation, to to not connect with people, that is not of God. And it doesn't matter what their lingo is. Real quickly, uh, within the past month, was praying with a man, and actually uh, our small group, uh, as as we gather around and start praying, uh, uh, just the spirit of the the enemy raised itself up, and so we began to pray over him and, and and demons started uh, acknowledging themselves, and so we started praying against them and casting out demons in the name of Jesus. This is, this is within the past five weeks. And we said, is there any more? And then he would name another demon. And one of the demons he named was the spirit of isolation. He, he keeps himself back from people. He doesn't want to connect. Be careful. Be careful. If, if you are being drawn away from people, you don't want to connect with people, that's not of God. God is very relational. Yes, we need solitude. Yes, we need time alone. But if you won't let people get close to you, there's some things that need to happen in here. And don't listen to a spirit that is anti-relationship. Rebellion. 
anti-authority. Just follow Jesus. Don't keep under any man-made authority. Within that good lingo is an anti-God spirit. I was talking to a man at the end of uh, the first night of our sold-out conference this past year. And when uh, God's doing some good things in his heart, as we're talking, I said, where, where are you going to church? He's like, church? I don't, I don't have any church. I said, well, don't you have a brotherhood? Oh, yeah, I've got a brotherhood. I've got a lot of brothers, you know, here and there, but I don't really go to any church. And I said, well, I, I really think you need to be a part of a local body. And then he kind of turned a little bit, and he said, I will never put myself under man-made authority again. Time out, time out. That's not of God. That's not of God. Not one of us are the church. What scripture say? We are members of a body. And when we say, I am not going to be a part of a body, I am not going to submit myself, you know who we're acting like? We're acting like the devil himself. You won't find a perfect church. You won't find a perfect leadership team. But brothers and sisters, God knew that. But he created us to be members of a body. You need to be a part of a local body. The church needs you. You need them. And we'll talk more about that tonight. But anything that leads you away from the body, anti-authority, definitely not the Spirit of God. Thirdly, independence and anti-brotherhood. That's not of God. An independent spirit where, you know what, I don't need the brotherhood. I'm going to do it on my own. That is not of God. Fourthly, self-exaltation, which is anti-brokenness. When God's Spirit works, we are humbled and God is lifted up. And over and over, a clear mark in all. I would like to say all these movements, but maybe there's a few exceptions. But in almost every false work of, uh, in the name of the Spirit, there's a huge factor of pride. Oh, you don't have the Spirit of God like we do. God's Spirit will never humiliate somebody. It will never lift itself up. It will never, I'm sorry, us as men, when God's Spirit is in us, we're not going to lift ourselves up and try to humiliate other people. People trying to teach others, if you have the Spirit of God, you're going to do this, and let me teach you how to have the Spirit of God, or let me teach you these things. Let me tell you something. When the Spirit of God comes upon people, God's Spirit will teach you what you're saying and so on. You don't need to. I'm going to teach you this and that. Spirit of self-exaltation, and, and again, we don't have time to go more on that. Self-guided, anti-surrender. When God's Spirit works, we're going to surrender. There's surrender. There's submission. Secrecy, anti-confession. Yeah, it's no wonder when this brother wanted to leave Igo that he didn't call us up and say, hey, I'm out of here. See you guys. There are so many of these spirits that are listening to that. Isolation, secrecy, anti-brotherhood. He was close friends with so many students and he's just going to slip out without him saying goodbye. We are children of light. You do not have to be a part of anything or do anything in secret. If you're a part of meetings, you're part of groups, or you're reading a book and you don't want anybody else to know it, uh-uh-uh-uh. Secrecy. That's how the enemy works. In darkness, anti-confession, where we as anti-honest, that's the spirit of this world. Now, these spirits, here's why I'm passionate about this to you all this morning. These spirits work within the church. They work within the church. Let me give you a couple scriptures. 2 Corinthians 11. For such a false prophet, if, if you want to get the whole, the whole chapter on this, you could go to this later on. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. For such a false prophet, a false apostles, deceitful workers, transferring themselves into the apostles of Christ. And don't marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it's no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Don't marvel that a work done in the name of the Spirit is where the deception comes in. Satan's not going to come to us dressed in black with red horns and a pitchfork and say, follow me. No, he's going to look like one of us. He's going to try to do it. In These things come from within. That's why it's so dangerous. Let's look at another passage of scripture here. 2 Peter 2, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. There are false teachers in our churches today who privately shall bring in damnable heresies 
even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, or pernicious means destructive, their destructive ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And that is coming to pass. You know what? Many churches don't like to, uh, don't do a lot of teaching on the Holy Spirit. Most, a lot of Christians, when he's talking about the Spirit or I'm led of the Spirit or God's Spirit told me, most people are right away like, <gasps> you know why? Because of how often it's misused. You with me? By reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Let's just quickly look. Here's what the Spirit of God brings. And I think you know these things. God's Spirit works in peace, in love, in hope. Let, let's pause on hope for a little bit. God's Spirit convicts us of sin, we read in 1 John 4. The spirit of this world is, the, the, the devil is an accuser of the brethren. And sometimes people get confused. How do I know when it's the Spirit of God? Or how do I know when it's the accuser of the brethren I should rebuke him? Because very much those things happen. Here's how you tell the difference. So, so get a hold of this. When the Spirit of God is convicting us of sin, you know what you need to do. And there's hope in it, right? If I would just humble myself and share with this brother, with his sister, or I would just, I would just confess this, you, you know there's hope in it, right? That's when God convicts you. When the Spirit, when the enemy convicts us, when the accuser of the brethren, Satan himself, when he, con when he accuses you, Again, it's not a good feeling, you don't like it, but it's a feeling of despair and there's no hope after it. You're no good. You'll never amount to anything. You know what? You messed up again. What's the church going to think of you? And, and there's no hope in it. When you are being convicted and there's no hope in it, then I would say stop. And I would re re resist Satan in the name and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you're being convicted, you know, you know what? I really do need to confess to that brother or I do need to acknowledge this sin then I would go do it. You see the difference? God's spirit, there's peace in it, there's hope, there's patience, there's kindness in how he works, there's mercy, there's honesty, there's joy, there's compassion, there's understanding when, in, in God's spirit working with us. We're patient. When movements come along and it's like, psh, you got to get this, and this kind of, there's not understanding, there's not compassion. Holiness. Do you know today that God is no more a friend of sin than he was back in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah and the days of Noah? God hates sin. God's Spirit is going to lead us to holiness. God's Spirit is not going to lead us to freedom of the flesh. When you want to talk about the flesh, what word always comes with flesh? Crucify the flesh. There's freedom in the Spirit, not in the flesh. He will bring about justice. He will bring about truth. God's Spirit is going to point us to Jesus. He's going to point us to love. He's going to point us to truth. And the fruits of the Spirit are going to be evident in that. Brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. Don't be deceived. Try the spirits. When I think back to 1 Kings 13, and it ends with, there lies the man of God who is disobedient to the word of the Lord. I have pictures of people that I know that loved God. I can tell you of a young man who struggled academically, and I go, we push you pretty hard academically. And finally he said, you know, he says, why don't you give us time for devotions? You know, like just block out an hour here. I said, when you get back home, your boss isn't going to do that. You're going to have to fight for that. So this is what he did. He started getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning so he'd have time to have his devotions before he gets on to his homework. Now, there's a young man that's serious about God. Today, he's not in the church. He came home, married a very godly lady, served on, the, served on the mission field. They have a heart for God, and some type of Holy Spirit movement came along. And what was interesting is all his friends couldn't talk to him. If you ever feel yourself starting to go like this towards people, that is not of God. And that young man and that lady today 
nothing even close to serving God. You don't want to go there. You have friends, you have family, you don't want to go there. Know the Spirit of God. Try the spirits. Try the spirits. Study to show thyself approved unto God. So we know. Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. I don't know. I don't know what all is going on in this community. I don't know what all is going on in this church or other churches represented here today. Father, I don't know what all is going on in the hearts. But Father, my burden is at these people here would love you so much that they would dig into your word and that they would listen to your spirit. Oh, Father, I pray these people would be so burdened that they would set aside time to connect with you. They would dig into the word, that they would walk in the power of the spirit, and they would know that the comforter, the Holy Spirit, is going to lead them into truth, and the Holy Spirit is going to lead them to make your name known, not their name, not anybody else's. Oh, Father, speak to our hearts. May we be faithful in walking in your spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.